Um, yeah, so welcome to lecture number four. And so in lecture number three, at the end, um, we talked about logistic regression and maximum likelihood. Uh, but I think I was a little bit fast at the end of this lecture. Um, so I will start again at the beginning of um, explaining what, what we mean by logistic regression and then um, um, how we want to solve this problem um, by finding the maximum uh, likelihood. And again, uh, you can ask questions during the uh, lecture, either here in Zoom or using Menti and this code here. Okay, so let's start. Um, so in the first two lectures, we talked about uh, linear regression. So it was part here um, of some supervised learning where we use the concept of regression, which meant that um, the, the uh, the target space, the output space was something uh, continuous. So we wanted to predict some, um, some value. Um, and um, logistic regression was an example, even though it's called regression, uh, but this was an example or is an example of some uh, classification. So the, um, the output, um, the possible output is, uh, is something discrete. So, <clears throat> So, and we, we use this example here of passing an exam. Um, I mean, there's no, so either you can pass an exam or you can fail. Um, so um, the, the target space is this Y can either be uh, zero or one. And uh, the features, uh, so the label space, sorry. So the features are in this case, uh, the hours you studied. So the time you spent studying and then the label is either zero if you failed or one if you passed. And then we have this um, training, ex training set here of different training examples. So here some people, um, for example, this person didn't study at all and it failed. And here this person maybe studied uh, 13 hours and it failed. But then there's also a person with 10 hours um, and passed. And here are some people who studied more than 15 hours and they passed. And what we wanted to do is um, model a hypothesis, uh, which gives a prediction for, fail uh, for passing an exam. And in the linear regression case, um, we would try to, to fit it with some, some line. So this would be a linear regression. But we can see in this example that this would not really uh, be a good choice of a model for our hypothesis. So in this case, we wanted to um, use um, some logistic function, uh, which in general looks uh, something like this. So maybe there's some point after which you usually pass an exam if you studied, uh, in this case, maybe 10 hours. And so this will be a model for logistic regression. Okay, and so here for this red function, this linear regression, this was just a function you learned uh, from school. So there we said that um, h theta of x um, is some theta zero plus theta one times x. And then uh, for the log logistic regression, um, we introduced the so-called sigmoid function or the logistic function. And this uh, looks like this. So sigmoid function or logistic function, uh, which we denote by capital S. And this is a function which is given as uh, one over one plus e to the minus x. And this function satisfies the properties that first um, it's between zero and one. And that if I consider the limit, x goes to minus infinity of this function. So you see here, when the x gets small, um, you see here if x goes to minus infinity, um, then e to the minus x goes to plus infinity. And therefore I have one over something really big, which goes to zero. And to the right, if x goes to plus infinity, s of x, then here I have e 
e to the power minus x, which goes to zero, and therefore I have one over one, which goes to one. And in the middle at zero, it is one half. And we want to use this function, or we want to bend this function, and we want to translate this function um, to describe something like this. Um, and to do this, we will basically use the same hypothesis as before, um, but we will plug this, um, this linear function here into this uh, sigmoid function. And with these two parameters, sigma zero and sigma one, we will be able to, to stretch this. So for example, we could, it, could make it more wider and we can move it to the left uh, or to the right. So, <clears throat> so this is what we do here. So the, the model for our logistic regression hypothesis, uh, which we also denote by H uh, theta, um, is just we, um, we plug this hypothesis of this linear regression uh, into this logistic function. Uh, so recall here in the linear regression case, um, if we have D features, so in the example before I had uh, two features. So in general, we, we considered functions like this, where we have D plus one parameters or weights, uh, theta zero up to theta D. And this we can also just write by saying, this is a transpose of theta. So uh, if theta is a vector, theta zero up to theta D, then theta transpose is just um, this, row vector, and if we multiply uh, so if I multiply this with a vector x, uh, x1 up to xd, this is then exactly uh, this sum here, yeah? And um, but this is not the function we want to use. We want to uh, use this lo logistic function, and therefore we will consider um, this uh, sigmoid function where we plug in this um, theta transpose times x. Okay, and depending on, so here's again the picture of the sigmoid function in the d equals one case. Uh, well, this is the sigmoid function, but uh, in the d equals one case, I have two param parameters, sigma zero and sigma one. And they will basically exactly do what I said. They will, um, with this, we will be able to transpose, um, uh, translate this, uh, this zero point here. And also we can bend this a little bit. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so then, uh, of course, then now the question is, um, how do we find um, these uh, weights. So, and for our study example, um, so there's again uh, two examples here. So it's the same training set, um, but I choose two different uh, thetas. So, for example, if you say theta zero is a minus 10 and theta one is one, and um, then you see that um, the hypothesis, if you plot this function here, uh, looks exactly like this. And we can also find out in this case here, um, for example, where is this point here? So this would correspond, um, so this X here is exactly the point um, where we plug in zero into this sigmoid function here. So in this case, we can calculate that in this case, um, we can ask when is this uh, zero? So we see this is the case when we have minus sigma zero divided by sigma one. And in this case here we see, and we have minus 10, minus minus 10 divided by one. So in this case, we have exactly X equals 10 is the point where we have one half here. Yeah, and, and in the other example here, we see that um, where do we have the one half here? Uh, in this case, if we call it X, then in this case, we have uh, minus, minus three divided by one third. In this case here, we have nine. So in this 
for this theta was minus three and one third. Um, at nine, we have um, this one half here. And depending here on this sigma one, so here we see the sigma one is one in this case. So here this, this curve is steeper. And here in this case, the sigma one is one third. So it's a little bit wider. Um, so maybe here you can understand how you can change this behavior of this curve by changing the sigma zero and uh, sigma one. Um, but of course the question is, which of these, for example, is now the better choice for our training set? And so what would you guess? Um, which of these would fit better? Maybe someone guess. The first one? Yeah, so Tanaka-san guess that this is maybe the better one. And this is actually the case. We will say to later see that this um, uh, theta here um, has a larger likelihood, and therefore this is better. So this is more likely um, to describe the, the, the training set. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how do we find the best weights? And um, for this, uh, we introduce some notation. So we see here that the values of our hypothesis uh, will be between uh, 0 and 1. So we can also think of them of being some probabilities. So what is a so we can say that maybe the the orange curve describes the probability um, of passing an exam after studying um, such and such uh, hours. And <clears throat> and some standard notation in uh, probability theory is to use uh, this notation here P A B, uh, which is called the uh, conditional probability that event A occurs given that event B occurs. Um, so in our example, the event A is um, um, passing an exam. And the event B is, I studied, for example, 10 hours. And then you can ask, what is the value P of passing an exam um, uh, given that I studied 10 hours? And in this example here, maybe the P would be, uh, well, here for this training set, it would be uh, 1. <clears throat> yeah, so as I said, so um, so we can think of this h theta of describing the probability um, that, so now instead of saying passing the exam, we will use numbers. So y equals 1 means uh, we pass the exam, and y equals 0 means uh, we failed the exam. So here, the probability that we've passed the exam, given we studied x hours, um, will be described by our h uh, theta. And here, this is just some notation that says that this function here somehow depends on this theta. And, um, and because the probability of something, um, the, so in this case, if the, the probability of not passing the exam, given I studied x hours, is then exactly 1 minus the probability uh, of passing the exam. Yeah, so if the probability is after 10 hours, the probability is 30% to pass the exam, then the probability of failing the exam after 10 hours is 70%. And so this X here will always be our feature and this Y here will be our uh, label. And in our case, because we just have these uh, two labels, zero and one, um, we can, um, generalize this formula into one formula. Um, so, so this y can be either one or zero. And if this y is one, we want to get this formula here. And therefore we, we introduce this, this function here. So if we set y equals one, we have a one here and a one here. So we have a zero here in the exponent and therefore this vanishes and we just have this h theta. And if y equals zero, we have a zero here and a zero here. So this vanishes and we just have um, this one minus h theta. So these two uh, formulas are just combined into this one uh, formula here, where depending on if y is one or zero, uh, we have this expression here. Okay. <clears throat>
and now this um, we want to find the best uh, theta. And for this, um, we introduce this word uh, likelihood, um, which measures the, the goodness or how good this theta is um, or how good this theta models actually our uh, trainings um, set. And um, for this, what we want to do is we want to take the product over all these probabilities in our training set. <clears throat> so if we have a given training set, like in our example, we have these, uh, yeah, we have these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 12 uh, training examples. So in our case, is n equals 12. Then for a theta, we want to define uh, the likelihood as a product of all probabilities where we take the here, for example, the probability that the, um, the label of the first training set, um, so in our first, uh, maybe let me copy this. No, maybe not. Um, so we, we take the, prob the probability that um, assuming we've studied the first um, feature in the training set, and then we want to take the probability of that we get the, the first label in this training set. Um, and here we use just the formula uh, we introduced uh, before. And what we want to maximize is we want to maximize this likelihood. Um, because if, if our training set is perfectly described by our h theta, um, then all these probabilities are actually one. Um, as we will see in, an, uh, I want to do an example for this, but uh, the perfect case is the maximum value for this L is one. And this can just happen if I multiply um, just once here. But usually um, this H theta will not describe perfectly our training set. Um, so maybe some of these values will be uh, smaller than one. And the goal is to maximize this thing here. Um, but this, um, I think I didn't explain good last time and maybe also not now. And therefore I want to do two examples and really actually calculate the, the likelihood of these two examples. Um, so this I want to do here. So we had these two different thetas. And for each theta, we can now calculate uh, the likelihood. So how likely is this that this theta here somehow models our um, training set? And, and here's again the formula. But now let's see in this case here, for this theta, um, how do we calculate the likelihood? So the likelihood of the theta minus 10, one, so which is given here. So this is now h theta of the, for this theta here. And what we need to do is we take a product um, over all these um, 12 uh, training sets. So what is the first value we get here? So here we have x1 and y1. So maybe we can make a table here, uh, xj and yj. So in the first case, maybe our x1 is zero and our y1 is also zero. Uh, and uh, so here we, we ask for the probability that um, we fail the exam. So y equals zero, uh, assuming we, we studied uh, zero hours. So in this case here, um, using this formula, um, we uh, y equals zero. Um, so we want to take one minus h theta. So in this case, the value we want to take is uh, one minus um, the value of h theta. So in this case, this is 
assuming that here this h0 is exactly zero, um, is one. And then for the next training set, maybe there, let's say here, um, we have uh, x2. And maybe the value y2 is a little bit larger. So maybe let's say here we have, uh, uh, sorry, I mean the, the h, the y2 exudes by one, so it's also zero. And this is maybe one. But maybe the h theta of one, let's say, is 0 0.1. Uh, then the what we uh, would multiply here for this factor here, because it's again uh, the y equals zero, it's again one minus uh, theta zero. So here we would, um, the probability that we fail, assuming we studied uh, one hour, and the value we, we need to take here is one minus h theta, so here, this one, um, which in this case is maybe 0 0.0. Uh, oh, well, maybe this value here is not correct. So let's say this is 0 0.01. Then this value here is 0 0.99. Yeah. So here we really always take the difference between in the case when the y's are zero, um, then the factor we take here is um, one minus the value of h. And therefore, if this h here is perfect, perfectly zero in these cases, we always would multiply by one. So for example, in the first training example, our h theta is maybe zero, or maybe in, in reality, it's a little bit higher. But here in the second um, h2, uh, the, the h theta, so the orange curve, uh, is a little bit above zero. And therefore, the, the factor we take here is not one, but it's a little bit smaller than one. And then uh, here would come more. And maybe, for example, in, in this case here, um, so here, have one, two, three, four, five. Um, so maybe here at x5, um, we have the value x equals nine. And the y of this equals uh, one. So in this case, um, what we would multiply is because y is now one, therefore we would take the value of h theta, which in this case here is this part here, which is maybe zero point uh, five or something. Well, in this case, maybe it's a little bit lower. Maybe let's say it's 0 0.45. So here we would have p y equals one, assuming we studied a uh, nine hours. Or maybe that's 10, sorry. So maybe x5 is 10. And then that's exactly 0 0.5. So here we see that the, the difference is uh, quite large. So if, if this orange curve would be here, then this difference here, um, or the, the value of h theta would be almost one. So we would get a factor which is greater. But here the, the error is actually quite big because here the y is one. And therefore the factor we take in the case y equals one is the value of h theta. And therefore we take this small value here. And therefore, you, we see that the, this, this likelihood of this thing uh, becomes smaller because we've multiplied with a factor uh, smaller than one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and similar, you see here that if we would multiply, uh, calculate the likelihood of, of this theta here, then here we would multiply this part with this part times this part um, times this part. And then here times this part, times this part, and here times this part, this part, this part. And here you see that 
almost all of these lines are almost one, except for the middle ones here, uh, which are smaller. And um, yeah, and the, the product of all of these numbers is then the likelihood. And if the function would be uh, perfect, meaning, um, oops. Uh, if the function would be perfect, meaning the, the orange line would hit all of these things, uh, then I would just multiply uh, once. And then the likelihood, the likelihood would be one. But usually the likelihood is between uh, zero and one. Are there any questions on this? I hope it became a little bit clearer uh, what we mean by, by likelihood. Um, so the likelihood um, gives a number for each theta and this number um, is a product of uh, probabilities and the maximum value of this number would be one and likelihood of one would mean that this theta describes our training set perfectly. And the more, the smaller this number gets, the more unlikely uh, this theta describes uh, our training set. And the likelihood formula is given by this product um, of these h thetas, if this y is one, and of this one minus h theta if this y uh, is zero. Okay. And, um, and now um, we want to maximize this, this product. And to maximize a product or this likelihood, which is usually always given by a product over probabilities, what one does is um, one considers the, the logarithm of this product. Uh, because this makes things easier to, to maximize. And because the logarithm, I mean, what is the, the logarithm looks like this, right here. So this is the log at one it's zero. And when, so the log of negative numbers doesn't make sense if you talk about real numbers. And here between one and zero, it goes to a minus infinity. Therefore the, the log of our, um, oops, the log of our likelihood of this L because the likelihood is between zero and one, um, the log of the likelihood will be between uh, zero and a minus infinity. So this log likelihood will be between zero and minus infinity. And we want to maximize this log likelihood and the maximum value we can get uh, would be zero. And this would be the case if the likelihood is one, which means this is a, somehow the perfect theta. And if you take the logarithm of this product here, then uh, this, these products uh, gets uh, transferred to, to sums and these exponents uh, become factors here. So the log likelihood of a theta is just the sum over all trainings examples where we multiply with the, the label, which comes from here, times the logarithm of the hypothesis uh, at this feature plus, which is this multiplication here. So this was a typo last time in the lecture, plus um, this one minus uh, the, the feature uh, one minus the label times the logarithm of one minus h theta of the feature. And now we want to maximize um, this log likelihood. Are there any questions so far? Please always also feel free to use Menti. So maybe I should recall the, the code. Oops, this was a typo, sorry. So in the chat, you can see the mentee if you have questions on this. <clears throat> okay, so 
let's try to maximize this. And similar to um, the uh, linear regression, so in the linear regression case, uh, we didn't talk about log likelihood. We talked about uh, a cost function, and we wanted to minimize the cost. Um, and for this, we used a gradient descent, um, which uh, the, so the idea was that we start at some theta, and then uh, we calculate the gradient of the cost function, and the gradient uh, pointed in the direction uh, of the steepest uh, ascent, and then we walked in the other direction and did this step by step, and then in the end, um, we maybe ended up at some uh, point where this cost is minimal. And here we will we can do the same. Uh, we can, uh, but instead of um, uh, minimizing, we want to maximize something, and therefore we use a gradient ascent. Um, so to to maximize the log likelihood. Um, what we want to do is we want to use the gradient ascent, which means we start at some theta, and then we say the new theta will be the old theta, and now we take plus because we want to go in the direction of the steepest ascent, so we want to go up, and then we uh, take the gradient of the log likelihood, um, and we multiply with some factor alpha, which is this uh, learning rate. So, so this alpha is just some uh, some number which is greater equal uh, greater zero, and which describes the the size of our step we take in this direction. And this was similar to this gradient descent, but the, the difference was um, that we consider the cost function j, and instead of a plus, we had a minus because we want to uh, minimize it. So therefore, what we need to do is uh, we need to calculate uh, the gradient of this uh, terrible looking function. Um, but in the end, it will turn out that the gradient is actually not so hard to calculate and the gradient will look actually quite nice. Um, so what was the definition of the gradient of the function? Um, so in, in general, this, this log likelihood is a function from r d plus one. So as an input, we get our theta, our weights, uh, which start from zeta zero up to z theta d. So it's an element, a vector of size d plus one. And the value is in r. And for such a function, uh, the gradient is just defined by um, taking the vector. So this is also a vector here in r d plus one where at each component you take a partial derivative in this uh, yeah in this corresponding direction so here you take the derivative with respect to theta zero then the next entry theta one and so on so in other words what we want to do is we want to take the derivative of this function here with respect to these uh, thetas and so for this we should uh, Recall so the so our h here our model for the hypothesis is given by this um, so maybe let me uh, so recall that this is the same as one plus e to the minus theta zero plus theta one x one up to theta d x d. So this x is also an element in R d plus one. So d is the number of uh, features, and this plus one is because we have this x zero, uh, which is always one. And the, in the example, we just consider the case uh, d equals one. So we just have uh, this part here, and therefore we just have one entry x, which corresponds to the number of um, um, hours you studied. Uh, but in if you have more features, uh, so for example, in this example, you could have two features, maybe the number of hours you studied and maybe the number of, uh, oh, there's a question. Um, 
but let me finish the sentence. So we, for example, we could have two features. Maybe one feature would be the, the hours you studied for the exam and the second feature could be uh, the money you paid uh, to the professor. And depending on these two features, um, they will influence maybe the, uh, the probability of uh, passing the exam. And then D would be two and you would have uh, three terms here. Uh, yeah, so the question is, what is the H theta? So the H theta is uh, this here. So this H theta is the hypothesis. So it depends on some theta, which are these numbers here. And this X are our labels. And in the, in the example, D equals one, uh, this X is uh, one and our, uh, X1 and here this X1 is ours, ours studied. <clears throat> Sorry, maybe I was slow reading this question, uh, but I think it's answered now. And this S is a log logistic function here. So it's basically, uh, yeah, this is the part here. So what we want to do now, so the goal is to calculate the gradient and to calculate the gradient, we need to take the, the partial derivatives. And therefore we need to take the derivative of this function here with respect to one of these uh, thetas. And there we see um, that this H here is given by this S of something which depends on theta. And um, so in the end, we will use the chain rule a lot of times. And at some point we also need to take the derivative of this logistic function. And therefore the first thing we would like to show um, is this lemma here, uh, because the, um, the derivative of the sigmoid function um, can be written down uh, quite easily in terms of the sigmoid function. Um, so you can say that, or the statement we want to prove is that the sigmoid function um, satisfies uh, the following differential equation um, which is just a fancy way of saying that we have a nice formula for the derivative of the sigmoid function, which is just given by the sigmoid function times uh, one minus the sigmoid function. And let's do this. Um, so in other words, what we want to do is we want to take the derivative of S of X. So we want to take the derivative of the sigmoid function, which is one over one plus e to the minus x. So this is now uh, calculus one. So we want to take the derivative of this function here. And here we need to use a chain rule. So I would always think of this being one plus e to the minus x to the minus one. So I get the minus one in front and uh, remove a one here. So I get the minus two. And then I need to multiply with the derivative of this function here. So the derivative um, of this function here is just uh, minus e to the minus x. So this, um, um, because we have these two minus signs is e to the x times one over one plus e to the minus x, uh, but now uh, squared. Yeah, oh, here's a minus x. So there would be two minus signs here. So one is coming from the fact that this here is um, to the minus one, which goes in front, and the other minus sign comes from the derivative of this e to the minus x. And now um, we can rewrite this so because I have a square here, so I want to show this formula here. So um, I want to have this factor, this Fx, which is this here. So I take one of these factors, one over one plus e to the minus x times e to the minus x, one plus e to the minus x. Yeah, I mean, this is not exactly the same, I just, uh, took one factor in front uh, because now this here is exactly uh, S of X 
And now we want to show that this here is one minus s of x. Um, but uh, I mean, what is this here? We can rewrite. Uh, this is the same as one minus one over one plus e to the minus x. Uh, because if you bring this here on the same denominator, then here you have one plus e to the minus x minus this one. So it's e to the minus x over one plus e to the minus x. And therefore this here is also the same as one minus s of x. So therefore the whole thing here is s of x, this here times one minus s of x. Okay. And therefore this, we see that this sigmoid function here satisfies uh, this formula here. And this we can now use um, to actually calculate the gradient of this function uh, because calculating the gradient means we need to take uh, the partial derivatives of this. And let's try to do this. Um, so first uh, the statement we will try to prove is um, the following. So here, again, is just uh, the log likelihood. Here is the hypothesis. Here is the definition of the gradient. And here is this um, differential equation we proved before. And now what we want to show is, and um, we want to calculate the gradient. And the statement is that the gradient of this log likelihood function is given by this simple formula where we take the sum over all uh, trainings examples. And here we take uh, the feature at trainings example J, uh, the, the label, sorry, the label at trainings example J minus the hypothesis at this uh, feature of trainings example J times <clears throat> and the trainings example um, J. So this here is a vector uh, and this here is a number. Um, so this here is a linear combination um, of vectors because this here in the end um, is, a, is a vector. Okay, <clears throat> so let's uh, try to, to prove this. So this is now as a goal and we want to prove this by using this differential equation and, to and by using this um, formula here. Um, so to calculate the gradient, we need to calculate the partial derivatives Therefore, um, what we want to calculate is the partial derivative with respect to some theta, let's say theta i, and this i goes from zero um, to d of L of theta. And um, for this, uh, we can take here the, the definition. So this is L of theta. And we now want to take the, um, the partial derivative of this function here. And um, so maybe the first step is um, writing out what this h theta is. So h theta is our uh, sigmoid function at this thing here. So maybe let me just write this. So this is the partial derivative with respect to theta i. And then we take the sum over all trainings example. And then here the label um, yj and then the log of and our hypothesis is given by s of and uh, s of so here would be uh, theta t x and theta t x we can write out so maybe then it becomes clearer so this is theta 0 plus theta 1 the trainings example j, the first entry 
up to theta d, the trainings example uh, j, the entry d, plus one minus this log one minus. Uh, so here, this is just theta t x j. So maybe just to, to save space, I will just write it like this here. So this is what we want to calculate. Is this clear so far? Okay. And so, so we want to take the derivative of this thing here. So this factor here doesn't matter because this doesn't depend on theta. So we just want to take the derivative. And therefore, um, what can we do here? Well, for this, uh, well, there's no chain rule a lot of times. So we have the log of the s of this thing here. Um, so, mm, so maybe, uh, so what we want is we want to calculate something like this. We want to take the derivative of log of s um, theta t x j. And um, so how do I take the, uh, well, the derivative of log is just one over this stuff. So this is one over s of theta t x j. And then I multiply with the derivative um, of this thing here. So here times d d theta i of s theta t x j. And and here, uh, how do I take the derivative? Here's again chain rule. So first of all, what is the derivative of this thing inside here with respect to um, theta i? Well, everything goes to zero except, for example, if I take the derivative with respect to theta one, um, then everything vanishes. And here the derivative with respect to theta one is just this one entry here. So in general, the, the derivative of this part here with respect to theta i. So if I take the derivative of this for theta i would be just the entry x i of this vector x j. So here um, the inner derivative is just x j i and times s. So the derivative of this where I, I still have this one over s theta t x j. Okay. And now we have here the derivative of s. And now let's go back to our formula, which we proved before. And let's put it here. And then you see that something cancels out because here we can now use this formula, which says the derivative s of something is just s of this something times one minus s of this something. So here, this is just s of theta t x j times one minus s of theta t x j x j. And here you see that this and this part uh, just uh, cancels uh, out. So in this case, we just have x i j one minus s theta t x j. So we see that actually the derivative of this thing here becomes um, quite simple. So this we would use to take the derivative of the first part here. And um, something similar happens if we take the derivative of this part here. So if we would do the same calculation, 
del di theta i of log one minus s theta t x j. Um, well, everything is the same, except here we have one minus uh, f of theta t x j. And here um, um, we will have a, a minus sign. Well, maybe let me write this out so it's clearer. So again, we have one over one minus s theta t x j. And uh, yeah, and I take the derivative of one minus s theta t x j. So here um, I will have a minus sign minus, and I will need to take the derivative of this here. Uh, again, so the inner derivative is again x i because I take the derivatives with respect to theta i and uh, then it's again theta prime x t x j and here it's one over one minus s x j. Yeah. But now I can again use this formula here. So, so this here is now again s theta t x j times one minus s theta t x j. And now we see that this factor here cancels out. And therefore this is just, and I hope I didn't make any mistakes. This is just minus x i j s theta t xj. Okay. So maybe it's a little bit confusing if uh, you need to follow and I write it. Uh, so maybe try to, to do it by yourself again. But now uh, you see that actually these derivatives of these log of uh, this, this hypothesis I mean, this here is just h theta, and here it's one minus h theta, that they actually look um, quite uh, simple. So here it's just x j of one minus h theta, and here it's just minus x j i of uh, one of h theta. Um, so we can use this now to, uh, yeah, to to calculate the the derivative here. So, uh, so let me take this. So here we have the sum j goes from one to n epsilon j. And here, the first part was just this one here. So it's x i j times one minus h theta. So it's x i j times one minus h theta x j plus, and then one minus y j. And now, the derivative of this with respect to um, theta i is, I mean, you can also write it out here. This is minus x i j h theta x j. So here it's, uh, we can put the minus here. And here I have x i j h x j. Sorry, it's a little bit small. Uh, but now we can put everything together 
Yes, so, yes. So one factor we have in everything here is this x i j. So we have x i j. And uh, this x i j we have with a y j. And here um, we now have this h theta times um, yj and xij with a minus sign. But here we also have minus minus this with this factor. Um, so this part cancels out. And therefore, the only thing we have left here is um, this minus 1 times h theta. So here we have minus h theta of xj. Huh. And this is the formula we wanted to show, namely that the deriv derivative, the partial derivative of our log likelihood with respect to um, theta i is given by the sum over all training example of this um, uh, label of this training example minus the hypothesis at this feature times uh, x uh, at the times this um, feature at the position i. Because this is now, I mean, the statement we wanted to prove is, is this formula here. Uh, maybe I bring it downstairs. So we wanted to show this one here. Um, so this here is now an equation of vectors. And this is just the equation uh, for each entry. So this we, we proved now for i from 0 to d. And here, the left-hand side is exactly um, is a vector of size d, where at position i, I have exactly this partial derivative. And here on the right-hand side, um, here I have this vector xj. And here I just say that I take the, the i-th entry of this vector xj. And therefore, uh, this here is exactly uh, this statement here. Uh, because this is just written in terms of vectors. And here we just have this equation for each entry of these vectors. OK, are there any questions for this calculation? So this now gives an, uh, given a training set, like in our example, we have these uh, 12 uh, training examples. Then um, for a given theta, we can now calculate the, the gradient of this log likelihood function. And this will give us a vector um, which shows in the direction of the steepest ascent of our log likelihood. And this, of course, depends on our uh, trainings examples. OK. So, so what we've proved now is this proposition here that we have this explicit formula for the gradient. And therefore, the update rule for our gradient ascent is that we have start with some theta. And then the next theta will be the old theta plus some factor alpha times this number, this vector here, because this is now exactly the, the gradient. And this we will now use um, to implement this in Python. And I hope now this formula becomes clear. And maybe some of you say now, wait, this uh, looks familiar. Because this formula here, if you think back to our um, gradient descent for our um, co cost function, then we actually had the um, exact same formula. Um, but the only, I mean, the gradient looked exactly the same, except for a minus sign. Uh, but because we have, instead of a plus, we use the minus because we want gradient ascent, uh, we end up exactly with the same uh, update rule. So of course, the, the hypothesis um, is different. And so there is a general model which generalizes this logistic regression and uh, this linear regression. Um, and for all of these models, uh, you always have this um, update rule if you use gradient ascent or gradient descent. 
though in this lecture we maybe just do a logistic regression and a linear regression. But anyway, uh, so now maybe let's switch to uh, the programming part. Um, and in the notebook, I will show you now um, also these formulas appear. Um, but I think now um, at least we understood how these formulas work. And here in this um, lecture, I did it for, um, for arbitrary labels. Um, but now in the example, we will go back to the example d equals one. So we will just have two features. Um, so this vector xj here will always be a vector of size two. And even more, the, the first entry will always be one. And the second entry uh, will be our um, feature, which gives the number, this is the hours we studied for our exam. Um, so the first thing I do here is just, um, I define the training set. So this is exactly the example I used uh, in the lecture. Um, for example, here zero hours and uh, didn't pass. And here we have this one example of 10 um, hours and passed. Um, but then also there's this one example of 11 hours and not passed. And then for drawing these things, um, I, I just use again this uh, matplotlib. Uh, like we did also before with the Tebasaki examples. And um, so if I execute this, uh, we see that I, we get exactly um, this graph like here. And now for example, I can also plot this one hypothesis um, we had as an example. So here I define theta zero and theta one as minus one and 10. And then I just plot um, this one over one plus, and this here is just um, the NumPy exponential function. So this is e to the minus theta zero plus theta one times um, the x values. So if I plot this on top, then you see that this is a, a one of these two examples I showed where the theta was um, minus 10 and one. Okay. And uh, so now here is a, so this is a, the model for our hypothesis. And here I implement this um, by saying, okay, our hypothesis depends on some theta and some x. And these are, um, so this is now the implementation for, for arbitrary labels. Uh, so here I just use this formula with the transpose here because this is uh, easy to implement because here at NumPy, so this is one over one plus e to the minus, and then here theta transpose times. So if you want to multiply a matrix with a vector, you use this function dot. So I take times this um, vector x. So this gives a hypothesis um, for a given theta evaluated at some um, label, a uh, feature x. And then we had this uh, log likelihood, um, which was given as a log of the likelihood. So this was given by this sum over all trainings examples. So maybe let me go here at the beginning. Our trainings example, I denote by Tx and Ty. So these are two arrays um, of size 12 in this case. And so to, to define the log likelihood, I say, well, n is now the, the number of trainings example. So with len, you can check the length of an array. And then the definition of our log likelihood is um, I take, well, I, maybe there are better ways to do this, but uh, I just uh, uh, define a variable here, which is zero at the beginning. And then I take a, a for loop here from one to n. And in each step, I just want to add um, this, this term here into this, this variable red, which I want to return in the end. So here um, for, for each j, I add this term here. So here, this yj, which is our feature. So this is either zero or one, which is exactly the j's entry of our trainings example um, labels. And then times the logarithm, which is implemented in, in Python as np log of our hypothesis h theta. And here, um, so this 
theta is the theta we plug in into our uh, uh, log likelihood. And the x I take is this array here. Um, so this one is um, our x0. And this x, the second entry of this vector, is exactly our uh, trainings feature. So this here gives exactly this term, and then plus um, this term here with a similar formula. And then, for example, I ask in the lecture, what do you think has a, the larger likelihood? And Tanaka pointed out or guessed that maybe. So I gave you two examples of thetas. So the one theta was minus 10 and 1, which was the curve I, I showed, which was this one here. And maybe let's also draw the other one. So this was minus 3 and 1 third, I think. Yeah, so now the orange one is uh, minus 3 and 1 third, and the green one is minus 10 and 1. And then I ask, what do you think has the, the larger likelihood? And the answer was maybe the green one with the minus 10 and 1. And, uh, and we see here the log likelihood of this thing here is minus 2. And the log likelihood of this minus 3, 1 third is minus 2.5. Uh, so indeed, the, um, the, log likely, or the likelihood of this example is larger than the likelihood of this. And now these are negative numbers uh, because we take the logarithm of the likelihood and the likelihood is between 0 and 1. And therefore, the log likelihood is between minus infinity and 0. And here, this minus 2 is nearer to 0 than this minus 2.5. So therefore, these thetas are uh, better. And now we want to, to find the, the best or the better thetas than these. So these are just guessed by playing around. So therefore, we defined um, this, or we, we proved that the gradient of the log likelihood function is given by this formula here. So this is a, the proposition uh, I just proved. And, um, and this we did by calculating. Um, so this is here an equation of vectors. And we proved this um, for each entry. So these are vectors of size d. Well, in our example, this d is um, 1. So we just have uh, two i's here. So i goes from 0 to 1 in our example. And um, yeah, we, it was given by this here. So to, to implement this gradient, um, which I call gradient, so for a given theta, we want to calculate the gradient. And again, because here I take a sum over something, I start with a 0 vector. I say g is a 0 vector. And then I, I take a sum from 1 to n. And in each step, I add this term here um, to this vector here. And this I do for these two entries. So for i equals um, 0 and for i equals uh, 1. So in the, in the case uh, i equals 0, um, this uh, x0 uh, zero is 1. So here's, maybe I can write it here. So this is times 1. And the second one, uh, the second entry, the case i equals 1, I multiply with the trainings um, feature at the position j. And here I take the trainings uh, label minus the hypothesis evaluated at the trainings um, feature. And again, in this example here, in the implementation, I take the normalized gradient, meaning I always normalize this um, vector to size 1. But uh, we could also remove this um, to. So if we would remove this, then your the length of your steps uh, would also change depending on if it's really steep or not so steep. Because if, the, if you calculate the gradient of a function and the function is really steep, so the gradient doesn't just show into the direction of the steepest ascent, but also the length of the gradient somehow tells you um, how steep this is in this direction. But in this case, yeah, I normalize this and say, I just care about the direction I need to go 
and the, the step I want to take will just depend on the alpha. So I always know in each step, I really go exactly one alpha step. So this is the gradient and now uh, we can uh, consider this update rule. So we want to implement starting with some theta. The next theta will be given by all theta times some learning rate uh, times a, a gradient. So here it's again uh, the formula from before. So this we do here. So in this case, uh, I start at zero for the theta. And so this maybe you can ignore now. This is just I, I want to, for the visual, uh, for the picture later, I just want to remember the points I, I walked along. So, but here, so this alpha is a learning rate. And here in this case, I use 5,000 steps. So the more steps you use, the more precise it becomes. And if you increase the alpha, then your steps become larger. And uh, maybe you go faster to the, to the maximum. Uh, but maybe you can also, if you take it too large, you can jump over the maximum. Um, and then here I do, depending on the steps, um, so I want to do this rule a certain number of times. I use exactly this formula we proved. I say the new theta is the old theta plus alpha times the gradient at this theta. And well, if I do this, then we see the thetas I get in this case with this learning rate um, gives me minus seven and 0 0.6. So maybe let me go up and also plot this one. So this should be the red line, I think. Uh, so maybe let me remove one of them. So the first one should always be orange, then maybe the second one green and the third one. So the orange one is the, with the at minus 10 and one and the green one is now our, the one we get from our gradient um, ascent. And we can also check. And now I hope the, this I actually didn't check, the log likelihood of this guy here is ah so I got lucky so <laughs> the log likelihood of this is actually minus 1.9 so this is um, has a larger likelihood than these two other examples okay and and again um, so in general you don't need to understand every line of code here um, I just want to um, so the, the important points are always just these, um, these um, code lines, which corresponds to the mathematical formulas. Uh, but now here in this case, for example, don't worry too much about all this code. This is just for uh, visualizing things. And maybe you can just, if you want to play around by yourself, you can maybe just try to adapt this a little bit or just um, accept that this works. So you don't need to understand everything here. Um, but what I implemented here is just um, uh, now a visualization of the gradient descent. So I said I started with theta zero zero. So this point here, so you see here the first um, point, there I started. Then you see here the function goes up. So the first step was I went to this point here and then maybe it also goes up there and then maybe it walked around so here you see maybe the, the size of alpha. I walked around here and then in the end, so you see here the function goes up. So what I plotted here is the, uh, the log likelihood function. You see here the value is something negative up to zero. Uh, so the perfect likelihood would be zero, but you can see here the, maybe here somewhere is the maximum. So maybe I should walk a little bit more uh, but it's still um, below zero. And so maybe now we can uh, change a little bit the 
than alpha. So maybe let's So here I now uh, increase the alpha by a factor of four. And um, we also get a new theta. And now let's see if I draw this again. So if I draw it again, now we should see that uh, maybe the first step here, the length of this step increased also by a factor of four. Uh, so let me draw this. Yeah, you see that uh, um, here I start again here. Then maybe he jumped there. And then he jumped around uh, like this, jumped around, and then ended up there. And there you also see that maybe in this case, this alpha is too big, uh, because maybe the maximum would be in the middle. Uh, but because of this alpha is too big, I would actually never hit the middle, because I always would jump around uh, from one side uh, to the other. <laughs> 